Welcome to episode 260 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I am Dan Hilton, and I am joined by my friend and yours, it's Frances Tomas. Today, Frances and I are going to be updating about some changes involving the podcast and recapping the season for Barcelona that just ended. Now, I know people are already moving on to transfers and exits and all that, but we'll have plenty of time to talk about all that business. For now, let's review the season that was. But before we do that, Frances, there's two important words. You are already jumping at the bit. It's a certain greeting that you always say that people have been asking for. So, yeah, a little premature, but what are those two words, Frances? Um, hola, cules. I think you got it right. Um, <laughs> anyone asking for that, really, you need to have a really hard look at yourself. Uh, it's just two words. Um, obviously, I miss you, too. I miss you, too. Um, I'm delighted to be with you again, Dan. And um, looking back at the season is in the order of the day, and I cannot wait to get started. Yep, so let's get the, we'll say the other business out of the way before we talk FC Barcelona. So for those who follow us all on, on social media, you might know that Frances is taking a step back from the podcast. And the last time he did so, for those longtime listeners, was back in 2018, you might remember. And that gave me then an opportunity to get to know some of the important people in the English-speaking Barca community. But this time around, I am uh, even three years older than that, so I do need a bit more stability this time around. So you can expect the same faces week in and week out uh, in the coming weeks. The chemistry will be different than what has been the, I, I think, a fine friendship between Frances and I. People are all different, but the podcast, as you know, it won't be changing. That is a promise. It'll be the same formula that you're used to starting in two weeks with La Ronda, uh, because next week we do have Naveed on to discuss all things La Masia this season, and then the following week will be our introduction to the new regulars. As for Frances, I promise, and he can promise himself that you haven't seen the last of him, he is invited back whenever he wants, so don't you worry, he'll be around. Uh, Frances, I, I think I hit everything there, right? I don't want to speak for you, but uh, yeah, it's it's not a it's not a goodbye, it's, he's, he, we are friends. There is nothing going on behind the scenes. Um, no, the Super League thing did not tear us apart. We're, <laughs> we're all fine. So, yes, Frances will be around whenever he'd like to be. And he's a busy man. But uh, don't worry, he's not really, truly going anywhere. He'll be, he'll be on behind the scenes. Of course, of course. I've got no idea what people have been saying. But ultimately, um, I've been doing a podcast for four years, sort of thing. Um, Barca blog for what 12 or 11 years now yep. and uh it is now time to step aside a little uh doesn't mean i'm going anywhere i mean whenever dan needs me he can just call me and then i'll jump in um we always we've been doing that for four years jumping in at short notice and uh, being really flexible with each other's schedules etc so if i'm ever needed i'll come back but ultimately there are other things that i need to tend to and uh all good you know there's no there's nothing major going on it's just you know, to do with, um, with my other part of my life, basically. But I love coming to the podcast. I'll continue to watch Barca, obviously. I've done that for nearly 40 years now. And whenever I'm needed, I'll, I'll be back. But it won't be as often. Right. So, again, nothing crazy. It'll be the same podcast you always knew. But, uh, again, I, I'm looking forward to also meeting some new friends and, again, continue to try to build and grow. So this, this can be a watershed moment, could be a start of a, a new era, if you will. But in truth, it's still the same Barcelona podcast since 2017. Uh, and we're now hoping that with Frances, basically uh, for baseball fans coming out of the bullpen and just having a few more regular starters and regulars, that means you might get more podcasts in your ears, that being one to two times a week. There could be more happening on the video side of stuff. Um, social media. So yeah, look out for all that because we have some fun things. And with the new season set to begin in a few months, that gives me a pretty good runway, uh, like an airplane, to to get this on to next season, firing on all cylinders and firing even better. But again, before we do that, we have to take the man that's helped us for four years on the podcast and talk about the season that just ended. Somehow, Frances, you and I have managed to do this podcast through two years of Ernesto Valverde, uh, six months of Kike Setien. <laughs> And then uh, what could be the first of two years or potentially the last year of Ronald Koeman as we record this? We don't know. Things are up in the air, so that's why we won't worry about it. We're going to worry about his first season in charge of FC Barcelona, the club where he became a legend. So I'm going to kick this off with a topic. Best moment of the season, Frances, and I'll throw that to you. Um, the best moment of the season for me was when we managed to win a lot of games consecutive, consecutively. Um, I don't really have the exact figure, but it felt like around 13, 14 matches sort of thing. 
Um, that led us to a great run of form. Um, there's players that, for example, Pedri and the Young, and that were instrumental at that time. Um, obviously, by that time of the season, Messi had already come back to the team, had not, not sort of physically because he's been playing all season, but mentally he was geared on. Um, he was um, nurturing the new talents to grow. And uh, I really enjoyed seeing them win. To be honest, it's, it, to me, it was seamless. Um, it, they just started winning one day and then pretty much they never really looked back. And um, I was really pleased to see. Um, they were playing good enough football. I mean, I don't think we're ever going to reach the Pep Guardiola peak era anymore. So I think that people need to stop sort of um, aiming that high every single time because otherwise you're just sort of killing your own joy while you watch Barca. Um, but they were... Great results, obviously, culminating in the Copa del Rey win. And for me, it wasn't a moment. It was a culmination and a really good run that, to be fully honest, I wasn't really expecting this season. Yeah, I was thinking it was the 4 nothing against Athletic Club when Barcelona won their first trophy in almost two years. So that was a big moment, sure. But I think prior to that, the comeback against Granada in the Copa del Rey, uh, I can judge the best moment of the season by the one and only time that, you know, I'm a very reserved guy. I don't hoot and holler during games. So for me to be up standing in my living room and yelling at the TV, not taking notes, not thinking about anything. And this is before I started doing the Twitch stream for FC Barcelona. So I'm standing up in my living room, screaming around with Jordi Alba and Antoine Griezmann and Messi when they scored that, the, the final comeback goal to send it to extra time. And so I, I think for me, that's the moment of the season. Oddly enough, with the lowest moment of the year, I think it also is Granada. It's the moment when the Liga was no longer really, truly possible, when it, it felt like the Liga was possible and then slipped through their fingers, and they, they fell apart after one half. And that was the first time that all season where the other lowest moment to me was the 4-1 loss to PSG. And the reason why those two lowest moments are different is because against Granada, they were up to nothing, and they should have won that match. And the Liga felt like it was in their hands. And, you know, we've been talking all season long about... Barcelona weren't good enough to win the league this season. And if they had been fighting for fourth place or third place all season long just to get to that place, that would have been something. But because the league was possible, that's kind of what made it more disappointing. That's what made it hurt uh, hurt more. And for PSG, the 4-1 loss to, in the first leg of the Champions League, that was the one match this season I thought when Barcelona were just inferior to their opponent in all regards. They played Atleti super tight twice. They played poorly, but still could have gotten something against Real Madrid in both El Clasicos. Uh, but PSG was just, they were getting outclassed. They, just, they weren't as good as PSG. Uh, they were the far inferior side. And so the reason why that would be the lowest moment is that was that, that reality check where at that moment, as you had mentioned, Barca were actually playing well. They, st they started playing well when they switched to the 3-5-2 in January. And then that PSG moment was two months of playing well. And yet they were still not good enough. Right. So that was basically the two moments when you had to wake up and say, ah, I thought they made me believe they played well and they made me believe. But unfortunately, this season, they just didn't have enough there. So for me, it was interesting that Granada was both part of the best moment of the season and my worst moment, too. Yeah. Coincidental, coincidental that um, obviously you would normally say that the worst moments in any season are where we lose the competitions. But this season was so clear that it was in those two particular games. Um, you basically taken the words out of my mouth. So I'm going to go for a very disappointing, probably not the worst, but a very disappointing time in the season, which is when Ansu Fati got injured. Um, yeah. If you think about it, Ansu Fati was stellar um, in the beginning of the season. He scored, he was scoring for fun. He was scoring a lot more than Messi and uh, I've already sort of hinted about that before. Messi didn't really start the season mentally ready for, because obviously he wanted to go away last summer, didn't he? He had it all done with Manchester City. There was the famous interview, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so having Ansu Fati being injured that severely, that early, when he was a, a standarte, when he was the beacon of our team, was really disappointing. Obviously, at the time, we didn't know that it was going to be a season-ending injury. We just thought he was going to come back within a couple of months maximum, but he's been a recurring injury. Um, the, the, the physios, the doctors don't really seem to be getting to the bottom of it. And I just hope um, that he can be fit enough to start next season so that he can put his nightmare behind. But think about what the season of Barca would have been if Ansu Fati had been performing at that level, or maybe even a little bit lesser throughout the next 10 months. It's even worse because when he originally was injured, February was the original return date. 
and then the return date got pushed back to March and then April. So, right, that's not one individual moment, but the slow burn of feeling like Ansu Fati is not only not going to be able to help this season, but potentially this 18-year-old kid and what's going to happen to his career in the long run when he has all these setbacks, especially in his knees, for a player that uses his speed. And yeah, it, you're right. That was a slow burn of frustration and, and disappointment. I think even looking back, that might wind up being the worst moment of the season four or five years from now. That's how sad, that's how frustrating it could be. So I don't want to scare anybody. I, yeah. It would depend what he done. It would depend on whether he can actually come back to right. be the player that he was. Um, as we know from many years of experience watching sports, when you've got an injury and you're away for that long, it's not a guarantee that you'll be mm-hmm. the same player. Obviously, the, 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 the good thing about Ansu Fati is that he's obviously his speed, his stamina, his willingness, his freshness, dynamism, etc. But there's more to Ansu Fati than just that. Mm-hmm. He's a very intelligent player. He understands his positioning. He understands the Barca formation. He is a Catalan at heart. I mean, he's been playing for Barca for donkey's years. And uh, he's one of the unsung heroes, even though he hasn't played this season. And, you know, all of those elements will help him move forward. Whether he would be in the same way and the same type of player, we don't really know. But I think he's got enough skill to, if his body allows him to come back at professional level, which I hopefully, you know, really, really hopefully wish he does, then, then he could be a different player, the same player, but still a valid player for us. Yeah, he was the player of the season for the first month and a half before Messi really yeah. got going. So the next question being that, yeah, for the first month and a half, it was, it was Fati. But aside from Messi, who was your player of the season this year? Uh, Pedri. Absolutely, mm-hmm. without a shadow of a doubt, Pedri. He's a 17, obviously now 18-year-old that has become a starter at Barca. There are a lot of people, Pjanic, for example, um, even you can even go higher and go the young as well, that not failed miserably, miserably in the first season, but didn't really make the team. And this is a 17-year-old guy that is not really old enough to play for Barca B, that he's starting every single match for Barca. I think he ended up the season with 50 appearances, which 50, is yeah. insane. Well, 52, yeah, which is go. the most of every player. Which is incredible yeah. that he played the most matches of any other player at Barcelona this year. Exactly. And that includes the goalkeeper. So it mm-hmm. is mind-blowing. That is mind-blowing. Uh, to play 52 games in a season at Primera División level at 17 is extraordinary. What Pedri has done is out of this world. And not just the fact that he's been chosen because he's the preferred one for whatever reason. That I know a lot of people obviously are going to argue against this. But he deserved it. He was instrumental in every, every step of the, of the pitch. He would move the ball forward. He enabled Messi to get gear. And this, this is really a big thing to say. He enabled Messi to find Messi again, you know, to find the job of playing for Barca again. And he got Messi going, not the other way around. And uh, that, that was incredible. He was um, associating with everyone around him. He was finding spaces. His touch is unbelievable. He, not just that, and that was sort of earlier in the season. As the season developed, I think his defensive game improved as well. And uh, he was recovering a lot of balls, obviously helping Busquets uh, not feeling and looking so vulnerable as he did at the beginning of the season. Granted, having the three centrales, the three centre-backs at the back, obviously helped everybody in midfield, especially Busquets, but also Pedri. And of course, I think the last probably five, six matches from Pedri, he declined a bit. But, you know, having already played 46 matches by that time, he's yeah. natural. So. Um, without a shadow of a doubt, um, excellent season for Pedri. Yeah, certainly I can see that. Uh, Pedri has exceeded all expectations. I watched him last year at Las Palmas. He was fun. He had a little bit of sauce. I thought he would come off the wing. Really, that's what I thought he would do, be the be a left winger this year. Basically what Coutinho was set up to try to do in that 4-2-3-1. But I think the the 3-5-2 worked because Pedri worked in that system. And he worked and learned how to play with Busquets. He lo- worked and learned how to play with De Young. And so my player this season was, um, I think a lot was asked of Frankie De Young, and that's why Pedri's a good shout. But for me, De Young was the best non-Messi player this season. I thought he was regularly up to the task, especially given what he was last year, when he kind of did disappoint in, in, in ways that we expected him to. Uh, but, you know, double pivot at the start of the year in that 4 2 one Okay, not so great. But then uh, as a box-to-box midfielder, even in that 4 2 one he started to score goals. So we remember before the switch to the 3-5-2, he, he was scoring goals in total. He had seven this year, the most by any midfielder. So you knew that you need to get somebody to put the ball in the back of the net from the midfield that 
after Paulinho, after Arturo Vidal, and Frankie de Jong, they kind of changed his game to become that midfielder to score. He also contributed eight assists this year. When he was asked to be a libero in the 3-5-2 when PK was injured, he, of course, that helped them control the game. And then he also defended alongside an 18-year-old player and two inexperienced players on the right side in the second half of the season with Dest and Mingetha and or or Araujo over there. So game in and game out, he was running. He was carrying, even he was covering a ton of ground. So I think the now 24-year-old raised his level this season. And I think reached the expectations that were set for him to be one of the best midfielders in the world as he was against, or as he was with Ajax back in the, a few years ago. Um, and, and I think he did that while playing multiple positions, and that's what made him my player of the season. That You can speak about Sergio Roberto was supposed to be versatile, but De Jong was one of the best players on the field in any of the positions he was asked to play, whether an attacking midfielder, a box-to-box midfielder, at the pivot in for Busquets occasionally, or at the libero spot in a 3-5-2. So, um, yeah, I think the only issue with De Jong seemed to be fatigue, since just like Pedri, he did play 51 matches this season and almost 4,500 minutes. So he was durable, he was available, and just being on the field for Barcelona this year was more than could be said of a, a ton of the players who dealt with injuries. Yeah, with the young, I do feel that he was excellent as well. But if he hadn't been messed around and moved around so many different positions, I think his level would be much higher now. I think the team mm. would have benefited a lot more. But obviously, then we go back, which... You know, we spent hours talking about this, so there's no need to do it today. But the plantilla, the squad was not up to scratch. It wasn't built properly, you know, because if you've got the young playing at that level on a box-to-box midfielder, influencing not just the build-up of the game and the distribution, but also the finishing and contributing in terms of goal scoring and, and assisting, then you shouldn't have to put him as a libero. You shouldn't have to put him as a central. You shouldn't have to put him there. You should just continue to, to enable him to grow in this ideal position. But... Hopefully, there are some signings coming up in the summer, and the squad can improve in that way. Yeah, it's, it is actually almost a little unfortunate that as much as I felt like he was my player of the season, I still don't know where his best position is going to be at FC Barcelona for the next five to ten years. Is it as the pivot for, for Sergio Busquets? Is it as an interior, as a box, you know, a box-to-box midfielder next to Pedri, who's a bit more... Eventually, we're hoping attacking minded and can also score some goals eventually. So the development of Pedri is, I think, going to matter to that. Busquets and his timeline is going to matter to that. But it's unfortunate because you'd say that you'd hope that Frankie de Jong was so good at one position that he has to play that position irrespective of whoever else is in the midfield. But, you know, that's not really how Barca should be built. Um, and speaking of how Barca is built, it's built around Messi. So there's no superlative. I, we've been doing best and worst. But I think we just need to talk about Messi real quick here because the season, uh, it... The season started with Messi wanting to leave, as you had, as you had said, and we end the season with Messi potentially leaving, but on the reverse of that, now kind of okay, at peace with the fact that Messi put up a 30 spot, or in total, 38 goals and 40, 14 assists, rather, in 47 matches. I mean, those are just surface stats, but when it came to the advanced stuff, dribbles, key passes, you name it, he was close to or at the top of the charts in every advanced offensive metric in Spanish football. He, after having a rough start to the season, if you will, by his own standards. If Messi wins the Ballon d'Or, especially if Argentina do well in the Copa America, if Messi wins the Ballon d'Or this season, it's not that much a surprise. Because even at 33, he didn't show any signs of of slowing down, and he was easily Barcelona's most influential player. The only criticism I think we have of him would be that while I think it was his best season as a captain, he led the young players, he galvanized a team that was in eighth place at one point, and they won the Copa del Rey on the back of him playing really, really well in that final. They almost won the Liga too. Um, just like the rest of the team, he just didn't come up big enough in the big games this season. So that's the one critique. But other than that, Messi had almost a perfect year. Um, and even defensive pressures were up from the last three seasons. And he cared when Barca didn't have the ball, which was a criticism we had of him for the last two seasons. So, yeah, I think this is the best Messi we had seen in maybe two or three years. Unfortunately, again, he didn't come up big in the, in the matches that mattered. Yeah, for sure. You've explained it really well. Uh, I don't have really much more to add. Messi has behaved like a captain this year. Um, it is understandable that he was disappointed at the beginning of the season. I mean, if you really want to leave your workplace and you're not allowed to do that, um, even though you've got in a contract according to yourself and your lawyers, etc. Obviously, you know, Bartomeu and, and the people on the board disagreed and several lawyers did as well. But if you strongly believe that you should be allowed out and you're not, then that's going to be really frustrated. But he put that behind. He's got alien numbers yet another season. Um, as you already mentioned, he's enabled everyone else to grow around him. 
And as, as again, as you've already mentioned, if he ends up leaving this summer, which I don't believe he will, especially now, Aguero's most definitely coming. Um, I think that he wouldn't have anything else to prove. He would have done his time and he's free to choose his future. Obviously better for Barca if he stays because I, I doubt we will ever see anyone scoring that many goals, being that influential and being basically the, 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 the carrier of the Barca emblem for 15 years. It's very hard that we'll ever see anything like that, if not impossible. So let's enjoy it while he's here. Yeah, so the next category I have is back in the other direction of the age spectrum. I have best young player. And I mean, I'm assuming you're, you could just repeat this with Pedri because obviously he was the best player of the season. So, I mean, would you like to do a little bit of a Pedri 2.0 or would you like to give your... I'm a little worried that your backup might be the player I pick. So I guess why don't I go first here? And then if you have another player that isn't who I choose or Pedri. So even with Pedri being an option here, I had to go based on expectations on who I thought the best young player was. So Pedri at Las Palmas, having watched him last year, even at 17, I wasn't going to be that surprised. I didn't think he'd be this good, but I wasn't going to be that surprised if he was a first team player and he fit in the team. Um, it's surprising that he played as an interior, that being Pedri, as I said, and was this good. But to me, it was a player that I didn't expect to be not only not at the first team, but I did not expect him to be at the club at all, maybe uh, past this season. So this is a player that over two and a half seasons, you know where I'm going with this, right? Two and a half seasons with, of course, two and a half seasons with Barcelona B, he played 36 times in two and a half years under Garcia Pimienta. And that is not a discredit to Garcia Pimienta, who's been fantastic at developing talent and taking Barca B with young teams all the way to promotion playoffs year in and year out. After 36 appearances over two and a half years with Barca B, he made 39 appearances for the first team this year. Uh, it's just, it's incredible. Having watched him now for the last few seasons saying, I'm not sure if Oscar Mingueza is ever going to play in the first team for another uh, La Liga team. I thought maybe he's a lifer down in the third division or the second division, and that's what he's going to be. But the recently turned 22-year-old, even if the advanced metrics, especially defensively, weren't great, he was one of the best parts of this season. Um, and and some, of the se some of his season highlights, if you will, uh, he got the assist against Dinamo Kiev in his debut against November. And I think that comp that confidence really, really did. I already used the word, but galvanized him to have a successful time with the first team this year. He was superb in a 3-0 win over Real via the lead, a goal, and then another solid defensive performance against Huesca. And then I definitely say the goal he scored in Real against Real Madrid in El Clasico for a player that's been with Barcelona now for 11 years to score in El Clasico, regardless of the result. I know Barca didn't get the re desired result, but he was good in that match. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's crazy. He played one match for Barca B in October, where he played at the left back spot before his first team call up. Then he never played left back again this season. And yet he was a right back. He was a center back. Uh, I mean, just being able to play even both positions, filling in at three at the back, filling in as a right back when they played four at the back. Um, yeah, it's just, it's shocking to me how good he was. So Oscar Mangueza for me, I, I think regardless of how good Pedri was, was my best young player. Because for someone who watches the Juvenil Oz and the La Masia, for someone who watches Barca B, he's the player that exceeded expectations well beyond anybody else anybody else, regardless of who they were in the squad. Um, there was a lot of really good young players. Uh, Araujo exceeded expectations, Des exceeded expectations, but Mingueza was certainly my best young player of the year. Yeah, um, again, hard to disagree. Um, I think that my best player of the year is Pedri. I'm not going to say anything else because I just said it five minutes ago. Um, I thought that Mingueza was good. I think that, as you said, he exceeded expectations. I don't think his season was excellent, though. Um, if you look at sort of purely as to what a Barca player should do and what a Barca player should be in terms of performance, I thought, I thought he was good. Um, obviously, coming from where he's coming from and um, having the expectations that he had upon him, then being a good player at Barca level, first team level and Primera level, and obviously a team that can challenge for titles level, that was remarkable, but I don't think he was extraordinary. Um, I am struggling to find my third one, to be honest. I think... Ilash deserves a mention for obviously having progressed for the first team at, at his very young age. Araujo was good, but he wasn't consistent um, more than out of, you know, it, it being his fault. I think it was more about the injuries that yeah. kept sort of niggling and didn't really give him a sort of long enough run of games to really prove his worth. I think that 
he can be a very good center back for the future. He's obviously very strong. He's got a lot of charisma. He is good enough on the ball. But again, he wasn't spectacular because he didn't have that consecutive um, game sort of run. I thought Serginho Des was good. Um, I don't think he was extraordinary either. Um, but I think that if you're classing young players, not every young player is from La Masia. So I think that Serginho Des, given his age, he did enough to establish himself as a starting, starting right back. Um, obviously, he's not much to, especially given the season that Sergio Roberto has had, he's not much of a merit that you go ahead of him. And I'm sure that in your YouTube videos that you're going to be doing with the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10 um, scoring, you mentioned that in more depth, but I think Sergio Roberto's uh, season was abysmal for many different reasons. So Sergio that's going ahead of that is remarkable for a young player but I don't think it's extraordinary either. So I'm going to leave the third spot for the youngster of the season void, and I'm just going to give special mentions to all those three. Yeah, so I am planning on doing grades instead on the American system, so A through F, uh, though I, I think for a team that... What do you mean? I No, the numbers are even more complicated for me. So yeah, I, I think what we're getting to the fact is because even not even leaving it void for you, but when we're getting at with young players is that inconsistency exists so for i mean Gaitha, he was the best young player in march and april for araho he was the best young player in january and february dest was the best young player when he arrived in october and november he was really really good coming out of the gate playing left back and right back elash moriba was arguably the best young player in uh, the end of april and and to begin into may as he was establishing himself in the first team after he made that early mistake against Alaves in that 5-1 win, he put that behind him and he became a first-team player. Once again with Ilash, as you said, the expectations were that he would be with Barca B all season long. He was average. He was good, but he was average with Barca B to start the year. Then he gets his call-up and he was just as good or better with the first team than he was with Barca B. For Serginho Dest, he was a backup at Ajax when Barca signed him to basically be the right back because Roberto had just been injured and he winds up coming in saying, hey, I think I'm going to be the starter, the starting right back at Barcelona. So as a player, as not a player, but as somebody that I had been following as an American, Sergino Dest at Ajax, oh, I hope he can push through and become the first team, first choice pick at Ajax this coming season. That was the expectations for him as a player. So Dest exceeding expectations, Mingaitha exceeding expectations, Elash exceeding expectations, Pedri exceeding expectations. And that, I think, winds up being why Barca finished third in the table, because the youngsters exceeded expectations and overperformed. Uh, and so I think that leads us into the, I think the final topic here, or final two topics here, if you will, because when we're talking about players, at least, the biggest disappointments were all players over the age of 24, 25, 26 years old, because I think, again, the youngsters all exceeded expectations. And the ones who underperformed were a lot of the veterans players. So for biggest disappointment this year, um, yeah, I'd love to hear your case because I tried to pick one and I had a hard time picking one. I think I had, I, I basically had four candidates that, that I came down to um, as being the biggest disappointments for a, lo- a myriad of reasons, whether it was injuries, whether it was form, whether it was not showing up in big moments. I had four players that I thought were, were the big candidates. But um, yeah, do you, can you, I'm giving you a little bit of time as, as everyone knows. Okay, I'll say, as everyone knows, Francesca and I don't prepare our shows, as much as we should have for all these years. We don't prepare beforehand. So I'm giving Francesca a bit of time to think through his answers. So. No, 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 I've got it, I've got it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I've got several candidates. Uh, <laughs> but for me, honestly, yeah. the biggest disappointment is Coutinho. Has to be. He is the most expensive player in Barca history. He is a player that we had to loan out to buy in Munich because basically he wasn't really doing much with us. And, and we did really just had to get him out of the team. He went to Munich. He did a season that was decent, um, especially in the last game. He destroyed us, uh, part of the 8-2 horrendous defeat we had against Bayern Munich. He comes back um, like, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's eaten seven kilos of steroids just before coming back. You know, he's <laughs> standing next to Busquets, making, makes him look like a skeleton. Yeah. So you think that he's all geared up, he's fit, he's confident. He's just won the Champions League. He's going to come back. He had one, one good game um, in which he was better than what he was before going to Bayern Munich. And then he started diffusing. He started taking a step back and he started basically becoming irrelevant. Then, of course, he got injured. You know, you can't really control that. Uh, But when he was at Munich, he hardly ever got injured. 
and he certainly was never away from the from the pitch for as long as he was this season at Barca. So the most expensive player of Barca history coming back with some sort of high hopes, expectations, and then being totally irrelevant for the season is is for me the biggest disappointment. I can shoot with the next one if you want, or you can go. <laughs> um, is your is your next one is a little bit of a guess who is is this a player from the Masia? Um. Hmm. Uh, is this a French center back then? Wow. Okay. So we have different candidates. Great. 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 So I will. Yeah. I. I don't have a pick one. So I'll go. Let you go. Number two. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So that was my fourth one. Okay. So that was my fourth one. Yeah. No. But but he did. Hey. Hey. So little little pianist fact. He did get his start um, at at Mets, who does play or usually does play league on. So he does speak French. He got his, some of his training. But no, he's a, a Bosnia and Herzegovina international. Um, yeah, Pjanic was on my list as one of the four for the same. I think the same reason you're going to say. He, he was brought in for, it, again, the money doesn't even matter. Because he was brought in to save Barca some money over the course of the, the summer months and help Barca not go bankrupt. So maybe we should be thanking Pjanic for swapping from Italy to Spain so that Barca didn't go bankrupt so that they could move that money around. As I've said many, many times the contract, Pjanic's contract affects the balance books over the course of uh, season by season of what he's paid, where Arthur, because he was already bought, that that all that transfer money came in to count for the books in one summer. So they made $73 million in one year off of Pjanic and were only costing the year of uh, his salary, and they were able to spread that over the course of multiple years. So that's why Pjanic was brought in, not for any footballing reason. And, you know, I think what was missed, most disappointing, that even if he didn't fit in the 4 2 3 1, which historically speaking he was supposed to, um, once they switch to the 3-5-2, he's never played a position that fit in that 3-5-2, so it makes sense that he didn't appear. Um, but that said, what was actually surprising about Pjanic the most was, I know it feels like he was never around this season, but believe it or not, he actually was around this season because he did play uh, close to 1,300 minutes, which I think back and I say, I mean, he played 30 matches too this season. And looking back at that, it was I was flabbergasted to realize how many minutes he had actually played because he was completely irrelevant when he was on the field for Barcelona. He just never fit. Um, so as much as saying that he wasn't even given a, sh- a shot, and if you go on his social media, you know he spoke up this year that he was disappointed at the minutes he got and the appearances he had. But again, 30, 30 appearances, and he just never seemed to fit. It never worked out. Um, so yeah, I, I can't even say that he didn't. he wasn't given chances because, I mean... Yeah, I mean, he only he played one third of the number of, I mean, or one fourth the number of minutes that De Young did. But I mean, he's one of those big reasons why, because of I guess the manager never felt he could trust him. Busquets and Pedri and De Young they played too much. That was a problem that the midfield just too much rotation and the fact that Pjanic had lost his position to Es Moriba, an eighteen year old, by the end of the year tells you a lot of what you need to know about just how he didn't fit. Yeah, um, Pjanic is one of the very few players ever, really, that my dad actually said to me before signing for Barca, it would be great if that guy came from Barca, but obviously mm. Juventus are never going to let him go. And by the time he came, we had high hopes. Like, um, you know, we've got the tape. You can go back and listen to any podcast that we've ever recorded over the last four years. And uh, we both predicted, if I remember correctly, that Pjanic would be a starter at Barca. He would yeah. have taken Busquets' position. Um, at the beginning of the season, we were debating whether there was going to be a double pivot. And if there was going to be one, it was going to be Busquets and Pjanic. And that was sort of non-negotiable because at the time, uh, Kuman was going for the double pivot. Fast forward to now, and he's not really done anything of value, to be honest. Uh, he's not really taken the chance when he's been given it. Um, you think about the way that Ilash has taken his chances, the way that Mingueza we've already spoken about, Araujo. Uh, biggest example this season is Pedri. But I don't know where Pjanic has been. I I don't remember a single play. I don't remember a single game in which he's been influential, in in which he's added something. Um, If you think about, all right, so he's got the Makelele, sort of uh, defensive, recovering, building, and then giving to someone else to take forward. He wasn't even doing that. So regardless of how much he costs, uh, he costs too much because his contribution on the field has has been appalling. Yeah, so I got some other names for you, player-wise, and then we'll switch to it. Uh, so Clement Langley certainly had his worst season in the Barcelona uniform 
individual mistakes for him were at its nadir. He never made this many individual mistakes. He also didn't really improve with the ball at his feet in the ways that I'd hope he would. Uh, now in his, what, third or fourth season with Barcelona. Um, so yeah, for me, Clint Langley struggled. And then Sergio Roberto, a combination of injuries. And then he was being rushed back. Every time he was back on the field, he never looked 100%. So I don't want to make excuses for Roberto because I know the internet is completely all out on him, sell him, yada, yada, yada. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure he's ever going to have the talent again with the competition and the potential of some of the young players. He probably is never a starter starter at Barcelona if he ever really needed to be or should have been. But this season, certainly, he just looked second best every time he was on the field. He looked not only like a backup, but a player that couldn't be trusted at Barca. I think he's a player that belongs in the squad at FC Barcelona. He's the fourth captain. So I've told people that I, I know you might see rumors, but I still expect to see him next year. But it also needs to be a better version of him. But I also, again, I'm not saying he needs to be a starter, but there has to be squad players somewhere. And I think Barcelona could do a lot worse to have your 20th or 18th or, you know, whoever it may be, 18 through 22 on the roster be Sergio Roberto. I think that's completely fine. He was raised in the academy. He's a good player, but he wasn't that player this year because of injuries. Uh, and I, I think the system changing as much as it did when he'd get hurt and he'd come back to a new system with new tactics. I don't think that that helped a player that can't really rely on his athleticism. He just doesn't have the speed of Dest or Alba or Dembele to get himself out of trouble. He has to be comfortable with where he is, and he is not a right center back, and he's not really a right winger either. So when he came back for that three five two, and he was so poor, I, I don't. He doesn't really fit in that system to me. No, uh, I've got very little to add, uh, but I have to say I did not guess your French defender. Because I thought that when you said the French defender, I was disappointed. You were talking about Arun Titi. Yeah, but I don't think he disappointed us because he's been hurt now for two years. I mean, the fact that he even played this year is, I guess, exceeding expectations. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But he's, he was awful. And I, I, to be honest, and I, I mean, people may disagree with me, doesn't matter to me at all because this is why we do the podcast. I don't think Lenglet was that bad this season. Mm. Hear me out. He's been playing pretty much every game. Um, he's been one of the regulars at the back. Of course, he's had more mistakes because he's also played more games than ever, um, as far as I remember. Um, everyone around him has changed. So Mingueza has come on, then Araujo has come on, then Piqué has been in and out, and he's been the only constant at the back. Granted, he's had awful mistakes. Um, granted, he's, been, he's given some stupid, um, and that's the only way to call it, penalties away that have cost us a lot of points but I don't think he was as bad as most people seem to think but for me the the major disappointment in defense has to be Umtiti that you know he's getting an incredible like jaw-dropping amount of money every single yeah. month every single season he's costing our, our club a lot to keep him um, the, the, the ball was trying to offload him last season no one would want him and I think that you need to hold people accountable and you know we know the world is not fair, <laughs> you know, like we were talking about the, uh, different player seasons and we didn't even mention Griezmann in there at all. But Griezmann scored a lot more goals than 95% of the people in the squad. So if you had, what I'm saying is that if you had to judge everything by the same level, then the scores would be different. But you always assess someone on what they can give. Um, and if Griezmann can give a 10, I would say that this season he's given a six and a half, maybe a seven being very, very generous. But in terms of UNTT, considering what he could give or what he was given three, four years ago to what he gave, he has to be an absolute fail. So for me, the, one of the most disappointing players in the squad is not like Le, for me, it's UNTT. Yeah, it's, you know, when I, going through these players and as I was writing about the Grays and how I would kind of figure out who was good this year and how good they were and grading them on some kind of scale... Every player is graded against their expectations, and that is what I found over and over again. So for Ter Stegen, he was just below the expectations we had for him. PK, I think, was just below the expectations. Alba was actually better this season statistically than previous seasons, so I think Alba was actually um, just above his expectations as a net positive. Griezmann was basically at expectation level after what he did last year. So, I mean, the fact that he was better than last year kind of means that he kind of met or exceeded expectations. Dembele, same thing, played the most matches he'd ever played in a season for FC Barcelona, which means I think he kind of exceeded expectations just by being healthy and impactful at times, playing as both a false nine and on the wing. Trincao comes for more than 30 million euros, and I think 
even though it's funny to me because we predicted having scored eight goals last year at Braga, now being 21 years old, I predicted that he would score four goals this season or five goals. Whatever I said, he winds up scoring four goals this season, right? So to me, he actually hit the expectation I set forth for them for a young player who's 21 years old, who's coming from a, a different team, a different league, playing on the right wing in a, in a spot on the field that Lionel Messi occupies. I figured that Trincao would struggle this season. That was the prediction. That was my expectation. But then people look at the tag, the price tag and they say, well, he should be banging in more goals and he, he's kind of not been as good as we thought he were. But no, I actually think he's been exactly who we thought he'd be based on uh, just, again, all those factors of learning Barcelona, playing on the right wing. Um, so for me, I mean, it's almost a net whatever. But the other thing too about all the attackers... This can, is I jump in to, can I jump in with Trincao? Yeah, okay. um, I think that Trincao has gotten a lot more minutes than he could have predicted, that we definitely predicted. Yeah. And to me, someone that's gotten that many minutes and that many chances and that many games should have produced more, to be honest. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th- I, yeah, I, again, I continue to not, not disagree, but I just think the learning curve at FC Barcelona is, is so difficult. And if you're a, pl- a young player like that who gets out of form and, and, isn't, and isn't contributing... It, it's easy for those minutes to add up, those matches, those chances to add up, and then you didn't put the ball in the back of the net. We've seen countless young players. That happens to them. And for the attack as a whole, even with Trincao not putting the ball in the back of the net, Barcelona's attack scored 18 more goals in the Liga than Atleti and Real Madrid. Barcelona's attack, led by Messi, of course, with 30 goals, but that attack scored enough goals to win the Liga this season. It was the defense that let us down, that let kool down. Um, and that does, that does have to do with the attack because the press is one whole unit, right? So what, what Griezmann and Dembele, believe it or not, Griezmann actually pressed less times in the attacking third than Dembele per 90 minutes, which is actually an incredible stat to see. But as far as the press, it was better this year without Luis Suarez. I know he won the Liga, but the press was better. There were especially more defensive movements in the attacking third. But all in all, the press just wasn't solid enough, especially in the first half of the year with that double pivot. Uh, I, you know, we spoke for many, many occasions on the fact that even in game, the young Busquets, you could see them having conversations not on the same page, where things would change from half to half and 15 minutes increments at a time, and it just it wasn't working. So yeah, overall disappointments I think started from the back, and then you move upward up the field, and that's why I do kind of give Dembélé and Griezmann and Trincao a bit of a longer leash than other players farther back on the field because they, as a unit at least did enough to win Barca some trophies. They, that being Griezmann and Dembele and Messi, once again, did not come up big enough in the big matches. And that's one of the other big reasons Barca couldn't succeed. Biggest disappointment of the season, uh, Frances, though, now beyond that, uh, I, people are ready to say Ronald Koeman. People are ready to say Ronald Koeman out. No, absolutely not. This entire season was dictated by the fact that Jose Bartomeu was in charge of this club for the first two months of the season. And it took until March to get a new president. I think that is what is going to define part of this season as well. So my biggest disappointment was because of COVID. I'm not even pinning this on anybody. But because of COVID, Barca did not have a new president until March of this uh, of 2021, after losing their president in October of 2020. And I think that matters. I think that does matter to the season that we just saw. I, I know it, that Kuman was in charge all season long. I know that Messi was the captain and bought in. But I think if Laporta had come in in November we might be talking about a different season. I think it matters that much. Yes, but the, the pandemic is not the one that de- delayed the elections a further three months unnecessarily. That was Carlos Tusquets. Uh, Carlos Tusquets could have called out the election before Christmas, mm-hmm. basically, and it could have happened. It could have been done and dusted, but um, I think the guy really, really liked the chair. Um, obviously, he's been a directivo. He's been a board member for many, many years before. And obviously never been the front runner, never been the one in the front of the newspapers. And I think he enjoyed that a little bit too much, which delayed the arrival of Laporta. Could have been Victor Font. Um, I don't think it could have been Fraser. But whoever it was, uh, it, it, new blood was needed, or at least Bartomeu's blood had to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And I think that delayed us unnecessarily. Um, it looks like, well, let's not talk about signings today, obviously, but it looks like Laporta has got three or four signings ready to go, coming on a free I think that's clever, but um, I don't think that um, losing, wasting, um, throwing away around 70, 80 days of Laporta presidency was a, a great step. So absolutely, uh, worst decision of the season. 
was to delay the election. Yes, agreed. Yeah, so I think that'll put a pin in this one. I know people would love to hear Frances and I continue to wax poetic about um, the season. Yeah, I mean... Before, before we go, do we speak about Kuman? Do we assess Kuman for the season? I think from, people would like to hear that. Yeah, for, so I'd like to hear from you. From 1 to 10, what, what numerical grading would you give Kuman for this season? Okay, I didn't, th- <laughs> I didn't think it was going to come back to me so quickly. <laughs> um, I would say Kuman season is a 6. Six and a half, maybe. Um, I think that he did the washing up. He did the cleanup at the beginning of the season like he had to do. Um, I think that he fell short. But then in hindsight, Jordi Alba and Busquets has exceeded expectations. That's two players that we certainly, especially with Alba, we called out for them to be gone last summer. Um, in hindsight, they had more to give and Kuman has enabled them to give it. Um, as I said, between three and four trillion times at the beginning of the year, for me, it was a transition season in which the youngsters had to come through and I was not expecting to win any trophy whatsoever. I think winning La Copa del Rey is a cherry on top that I was not expecting, to be honest, uh, but that went well. Um, La Liga, I was certainly not expecting that we would win it. Um, I think that at some stage with like six, seven matches to go, it, w- it was palpable and you could feel that we could get there. So that built my hopes up a little bit. But then the end of the season, uh, it reflected what you've been saying and we've been saying uh, throughout, is that the, the squad wasn't built well enough to have a long-lasting effect moving forward. And then at the end, it just went downhill and diffused a little bit. And that was disappointing. But ultimately, I think Kuman has done a good enough job. Um, I doubt, we'll see what happens, but I doubt that he's been inspiring enough to deserve another season. Um, I think that Kuman, if Kuman was to stay, um, he could be sort of aiding a further transition. But I think for Barca to be the great, great, great club that is in our hearts and in our minds that we want to see, I doubt that Kuman's going to be the one taking us there. However, there's no one in my eyes right now in world football who can take over and guarantee you that other than maybe Pep Guardiola, who is impossible that he'll come back. He's never going to do that. So I would say keeping Kuman another season prolongs the transition towards a better future, but I don't think guarantees um, success straight away next season. But at the same time, if there's not really a replacement, what do you do? But for me, it was a, a good going to Notable. So between a C plus 6.5 for me. Yeah, I go back to expectations. That's what, it, for me, judging Kuman is based on different expectations and how those meet. Looking at his past managerial record, we talked about it right from the beginning, and I had made the YouTube video when I spoke about his past as a, as a manager, and I called him the roller coaster manager because that's what he's been throughout his career. He's been good sometimes, he's been bad sometimes, and I think based on his past managerial jobs, um, even coming off the, the, the national team job with the Netherlands, I think he actually exceeded expectations. I think he was actually better as a manager. He wasn't, again, um, Ricky Pooh's minutes be danged. Uh, he was less stubborn than he was. He was willing to change the formation uh, more times ever. So usually he just sticks to a 4-3-3, or now he's been a little more stubborn with a 4-2-3-1 at his previous two stops. But the fact that he was willing to go from a 4-2-3-1 to a 4-3-3 to a 3-5-2, try just different things out, see what would fit, see what would... And I know the squad was not built for continuity and for one particular way of playing. But again, that's not his fault. He was given the squad that he was given. And he was, again, a lot less stubborn than he was ever before in his managerial career. So I think that's a credit to him. So as far as the, if I'm waiting it on previous Kuman stops and previous Kuman managerial experiences, this is probably the third best stop he ever had uh, as far as like on that curve. So I, I thought he did well in terms of what I expected of him. What is expected of the Barcelona managerial job is to win trophies which he did just one of, and he failed to win the big matches. So as you, as you mentioned, Ronald Koeman just wasn't good enough as to what is expected of a Champions League winning Barcelona manager, not even if he had the squad to do that. So not winning those big matches, losing to Granada, losing to Celta de Vigo at the end of the season are going to be unfortunately what we remember. But I, I, I almost say, you know, we've been talking about grades. I said A through F or, or 1 through 10. For me, on a pass-fail, if we're just going to... I mean, you're a teacher, Fred, so if we're just going to do it in that way, I think he passed the test, but you can pass a test and not be the best student. 
So I think Barca need the best student uh, or the best coach, if you will, to carry on and to achieve and to, to get all the honors and all the accolades. But as far as pass fail, I think it was a success for Kuman in charge this season. He gets a passing grade, even if he's not the man. Um, and you and I both agree. I don't think he's the man in the long term at all. I don't think Barcelona are ever going to win a Champions League with him. I don't even know if they can win the Liga with him. But he did what he was asked to do this season. So comparing what I expected of him, yeah, I guess it was a... Uh, I, don't, I almost don't want to call it a success, but I think it was a pass on a pass-fail scale. Um, anything more to add, Frances? I want to give you the final word on the season. Final word of the season is that it was what we sort of expected. It was a season of transition. It was a season in which the team has slowly but surely welcomed new youth that will hopefully help us for the next 10 years. Um, I, as I said, as I said just now, I, I was not expecting to win a trophy. We did. That's great. But um, the, the, I think that Nada Laporta is in charge. Nada Laporta has done his auditoria. That's his audit and looked at all the numbers and, and he knows the state of the club. I think that we are ahead of a decisive summer from an economical, but definitely a sporting perspective. Um, I think that the, the, the decisive moment moving forward and it's going to be how much money is Laporta prepared to spend or Barca able to spend? I think those are two different caveats that need to be considered. Um, and I think that is, we're ahead of a crucial summer, not just because of the people coming in. And as I said, there's probably three or four players that are going to come on a free, which is great, to be honest, even though they're slightly older. Uh, I think that having players that can help the team and they, they come at cost zero, that's, that's a plus. But again, like we said last season, the cleanup that started uh, with Luis Suarez, Rakitic, Avidal, etc., needs to continue with your umtitis, etc., etc., etc. And you can, you can even hit Griezmann and Dembélé if the right price comes, so that you can reinvest it elsewhere. Most possibly Haaland or whatever. And I don't want to say too much about signings, but ultimately, the summer that's coming is crucial for the long-term success of the team. And Laporta needs to show why he was chosen. Yep. So at the end of every show, I usually tell you where to find us and all that. And, you know, I go through Facebook, Twitter and Patreon, blah, 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 blah. But before we go again, he's going on, we'll say a hiatus, a vacation or whatever it may be. So Frances is taking a step back from the podcast again, for those who've been us for all these years, you know that he's done this before. Uh, so it, to think that he won't be back is naive. Uh, Frances. Frances is a friend of the show forever, and he's the man that helped me found it. So, Frances, I want you to send us off today. Okay. Um, I just wish everyone uh, all the success in the future. I definitely will be the best and first listener every single week for sure. I'll continue to be active in the, in the group because that's actually quite enjoyable. And I just wish everyone all success in the future. And uh, whenever Dan needs me, I'll come back. Uh, even if it's at short notice, and that would be it. So I wish that you have a great show. I wish that you hear the next one, and all the best for yourselves. Forza Barca. Yep, and thanks so much for listening to the Barcelona Podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon, and Forza Barca. Forza.